Hello and welcome back to Tangents on Cracked Spines. I appreciate you all. If you're new, I would suggest going back to the beginning of this series as I do read public domain stories and they don't quite fit neatly into one episode. As always, listener discretion is advised as there are adult themes. We are currently reading H.G. Wells' The Invisible Man and we last left off with a highly bandaged stranger trudging from a train station to the closest inn in the snow, not setting up uh, a way to get his luggage from the train to the nearest inn at the train station, getting very angry at the um, the uh, inn lady, Mrs. Hall, for not being able to get uh, it picked up before the next day when he didn't try beforehand uh, and generally being mean to her while she's just like oh you poor man you've been in an accident but also you gave me lots of money so I'm trying to be the best host possible but he's being a complete and utter ass to her so she takes out her anger uh, on her scullery main Millie and later her husband Mr. Hall although th- uh, it is stated that he uh, takes some time, uh, a little too long getting home uh, from wherever he was, and it is highly insinuated that it's because of inebriation and not the snow. Uh, there was also quite a few tangents about... My dude, get it straight. Are they uh, spectacles or goggles? Because they're very different things. I did harp on that a lot. I'm sorry. Um, Although, there is a difference. I think he settled on goggles. And H.G. Wells did not create sci-fi. He just expanded on it. Love his stories. But he didn't create the genre. Oh, by the way, I have merch now. Uh, it's on my Etsy page. Um, I'll link it in the description because there's Tangent on Crack Spine sweatshirt. Um, a, oh look, with a book on the front t-shirt and on the back it says self-inflicted wound because y'all hear me say that a lot. And there is a Mary Shelley t-shirt that says Mary Shelley with her, uh, with an outline of her that says mother of sci-fi. Anyways, I digress. And let us start back with chapter three and I will try to make them British this time. We'll see how I'm doing. My voice is still recovering. Chapter three, the thousand and one bottles. Alrighty. So it was that on the 29th day of February, at the beginning of the thaw, the singular person fell out of infinity into Ipping Village. Next day, his luggage arrived through the slush, and very remarkable luggage it was. There was a couple of trunks indeed, such as a rational man might need, but in addition there were a box of books, big fat books of which some were just in an incomprehensible handwriting, and a dozen or more crates, boxes, and cases containing objects packed in straw, as it seemed to haul, tugging with the casual curiosity of the straw, glass bottles. And to be fair, who doesn't travel with books? I mean, if you're listening to this, you've got to be somebody who travels with a thousand and one books too, right? Right? No? At least you're e-reader now? But they didn't have those back then. Anywho's. The stranger, muffled in hat, coat, gloves, and wrapper, came out impatiently to meet Fear Inside's cart, while Hall was having a word or so of gossip uh, preparatory to helping bring them in. Out he came, not noticing Fear Inside's dog, who was sniffing in a dilettante spirit at Hall's legs. Come along with those boxes, he said. I've been waiting long enough. And he came down the steps towards the tail of the cart as if to lay hands on the smaller crate. No sooner had Fear Inside's dog caught sight of him, however, than it began to bristle and growl savagely, 
and when he rushed down the steps, it gave an undecided hop and then sprang straight at his hand. Whoop! cried Hall, jumping back, for he was no hero with dogs, and Fear Inside howled, Lie down! and snatched his whip. I know he did not whip at a dog. I don't care if the dog was trying to bite somebody, for apparently no reason. They saw the dog's teeth had slipped the hand, heard a kick, saw the dog execute a flanking jump, and get home on the stranger's leg, and heard the rip of his trousering. Trousering? Alright. Then the finer end of Fear Inside's whip reached his property, and the dog, yelping with dismay, retreated under the wheels of the wagon. I mean, a whip is probably better than some of the things they could have done, but poor puppy. I don't like the stranger already, because, by the way, I'm pretty darn sure at this point that the stranger is the Invisible Man, and it's three chapters in and they haven't named him yet. Who doesn't name the main character in the first couple of chapters? Anywho's. It was all the business of a swift half minute. No one spoke, everyone shouted. The stranger glanced swiftly at his torn glove and at his leg, made as if he would stoop to the ladder, then turned and rushed swiftly up blah, blah, blah. I can talk. Swiftly up the steps into the inn. They heard him go headlong across the passage and up the uncarpeted stairs to his bedroom. You brute you said Fear Inside, climbing off the wagon with his whip in his hand, while the dog watched him through the wheel. Come here said Fear Inside. You'd better. I'm starting to figure out that there's not a whole lot of difference between the way people talk in uh, the quote-unquote uneducated side of way people are depicted as talking in England as they are in the U.S. Hall stood, uh, had stood gaping. He was bit, said Hall. I'd better go and see to him. In. I said I would try to make him English. I really did. But as you can hear, my voice is still a bit gravelly. <laughs> and he trotted after the stranger. He met Mrs. Hall in the passage. Carrier's darg, he said. Bitten. Darg. All right. He went straight upstairs, and the stranger's door being ajar, he pushed it open and was entering without any ceremony, being of a naturally sympathetic turn of mind. The blind was down and the room dim. He caught a glimpse of a most singular thing. What seemed a handless arm waving towards him in a face of three huge indeterminate spots on white, very like the face of a pale pansy. Then he was struck violently in the chest, hurled back, and the door slammed in his face and locked. It was so rapid that it gave him no time to observe. I mean, you would have been going into a man who was half undressing anyways if he was trying to deal with a bite on his leg. Anyone would have been like, excuse you? Heard a knocking? A waving of indecipherable shapes, a blow, and a concussion. There he stood on the dark little landing, wondering what it might be that he had seen. A couple of minutes later, he rejoined the little group that had formed outside the coach and horses. There was Farinside telling about it all over again for the second time. There was Mrs. Hall saying his dog didn't have no business to bite her guests. There was Huckster, the general dealer from over the road. Sure. Well, actually, at this time, it could have been drugs and it would have been legal. But I doubt it was. But I'm used to them being, like, called tinkers and things like that. Interrogative and Sandy Waggers from the Forge. Judicial. Besides women and children, all of them saying fatul fatuities. Wouldn't let him bite me, I knows. Tazen right have such dogs. 
What do you bite him for then? And so forth. Mr. Hall, staring at them from the steps and listening, found it incredible that he had seen anything so very remarkable happen upstairs. Besides, his vocabulary was altogether too limited to express his impressions. He don't want no help, he says. Sure, we'll go with that. He said, in answer to his wife's inquiry, We'd better be a taken of his luggage in. He ought to have it cauter Oh, sorry, that's a guy. <laughs> he ought to have it cauterized at once, said Mr. Huckster, especially if it at all inflamed. I'd shoot him, that's what I'd do, said a lady in the group. He's putting who they are last, sorry. It was a very gruff sounding woman. Suddenly, the dog began growling again. Come along, cried an angry voice in the doorway, and there stood the muffled stranger with his collar turned up and his hat brim bent down. The sooner you get those things in, the better I'll be pleased. It is stated by an anonymous bystander that his trousers and gloves had been changed. Was you hurt, sir? said Fear inside. I'm rare sorry, the dog. Not a bit, said the stranger. Never broke the skin. Hurry up with those things. He then swore to himself, so Mr. Hall asserts. Directly, the first crate was, in accordance with his directions, carried into the parlor, and the stranger flung himself upon it with extraordinary eagerness, and began to unpack it, scattering the straw with an utter disregard of Mrs. Hall's carpet. See, this is why I don't like the man. From the very beginning, they don't make you like the main character. Kind of like with Frankenstein. I never liked him either. And from it, he began to produce bottles. Little fat bottles containing powders, small and slender bottles containing colored and white fluids, fluted blue bottles labeled, labeled poison, bottles with round bodies and slender necks, large green glass bottles, large white glass bottles, bottles with glass stoppers and frosted labels, bottles with fine corks, bottles with bungs, what's a bung, bottles with wooden caps, wine bottles, salad oil bottles, putting them in rows on the chiffonier, on the mantel, on the table, under the window, round the floor on the bookshelf, everywhere. The chemist shop in Brumblehurst could not boast half so many. Quite a sight it was. Crate after crate yielded bottles, until all six were empty, and the table high with straw, the only thing that came out of these crates. Besides the bottles were a number of test tubes and a carefully packed balance. And directly the crates were unpacked, the stranger went to the window and set to work, not troubling in the least about the litter of straw, the fire which had gone out, the box of books outside, nor for the trunks and other luggage that had gone upstairs. When Mrs. Hall took his dinner in to him, he was already so absorbed in his work, pouring little drops out of the bottles into test tubes, that he did not hear her until she had swept away the bulk of the straw and put the tray on the table with some little emphasis, perhaps, seeing the state that the floor was in. Then he half turned his head and immediately turned it away again. But she saw he had removed his glasses. They were beside him on the table, and it seemed to her that his eye sockets were extraordinarily hollow. He put on his spectacles again, and then turned and faced her. She was about to complain of the straw on the floor when he anticipated her. No, he still hasn't decided whether they're glasses or spectacles. I wish you wouldn't come in without knocking, he said in the tone of abnormal exasperation that seemed so characteristic of him. I knocked, but seemingly, perhaps you did, but in my investigations, my really very urgent and necessary investigations, the slightest disturbance, the jar of a door, I must ask you. Certainly, sir, you can turn the lock if you're like that, you know, any time. A very good idea, said the stranger. This straw, sir, if I might make so bold as to remark, don't. If the straw makes trouble, put it down in the bill. And he mumbled at her words suspiciously like curses. 
He was so odd standing there, so aggressive and explosive, bottle in one hand and test tube in the other, that Mrs. Hall was quite alarmed. But she was a resolute woman. In which case, I would like to know, sir, would you consider a shilling? Put down a shilling. Surely a shilling's enough. So be it, said Mrs. Hall, taking up the tablecloth and beginning to spread it over the table. If you're satisfied, of course, he turned and sat down with his coat collar toward her. All the afternoon he worked with the door locked and, as Mrs. Hall testifies, for the most part in silence. But once there was a concussion and a sound of bottles ringing together as though the table had been hit, and the smash of a bottle flung violently down, and then a rapid pacing athwart the room. Fearing something was the matter, she went to the door and listened, not caring to knock. I can't go on, he was raving. I can't go on. Three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand. The huge multitude cheated. All my life it may take me. Patience, patience indeed, fool and liar. There was a noise of hobnails on the bricks in the bar, and Mrs. Hall had very reluctantly to leave the rest of his soliloquy. When she returned, the room was silent again, save for the faint crepitation of his chair and the occasional clink of a bottle. It was all over. The stranger had resumed work. When she took in his tea, she saw a broken glass in the corner of the room under the concave mirror and a golden stain that had been carelessly wiped. She called attention to it. "'Put it down on the bill,' snapped her visitor. "'For God's sake, don't worry me. If there's damage done, put it down on the bill.' And he went on, ticking the list in the exercise book before him. "'I'm sorry, but if he can afford to keep having all of these accidents put down on a bill—' Are you okay? I tripped over a cat. I'm sorry. On the bill, why didn't he just rent a... Wasn't there another kind of room with, or two rooms where he could set up, like an apartment, and then pay for any damages? Why such a public place as an inn, even if it is the off-season? Such an ass. He went on ticking a list in the exercise book before him. "'I'll tell you something,' said Fear inside mysteriously. It was late in the afternoon, and they were in the little beer shop of Ipping Hanger. "'Well,' said Teddy Henfrey, "'this chap you're speaking of, what my dog bit. "'Well, he's black, lest waste his legs are. "'I seed through the tear of his trousers and the tear of his glove. "'You'd have expected a sort of pinky to show, wouldn't you?' Well, there wasn't none. Just blackness, I tell you. He's as black as my hat. My sake, said Henfrey. It's a rummy case altogether. Why, his nose is as pink as pink. That's true, I knows that. And I tell ye what I'm thinking. The Martin's a piebald, Teddy. Black in here and white there and patches. And he's ashamed of it. He's a kind of half-breed and the colors come off patchy instead of mixing. I've heard of such things before, and it's a common way with horses, as anyone can see. Ooh, that didn't age well, did it? Actually, no. In America, that's still perfectly normal, sadly. But people would definitely be heard saying that in a little tiny bar. Still didn't age well. That's 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 terrible. Any who's? Chapter 4 Mr. Cuss Interviews the Stranger And again, I'm into the fourth chapter and we don't know a name. I have told the circumstances of the stranger's arrival in Ipping with a certain fullness of detail in order that the curious impression he created may be understood by the reader. But excepting two odd incidents, the circumstances of his stay until the extraordinary day of the club festival may be passed over very curiously. There were a number of skirmishes with Mrs. Hall on matters of domestic discipline, but in every case until late April... Oh, I feel bad for Mrs. Hall. He's been there several months already. <laughs> 
When the first signs of penury began, he overrode her by the easy expedient of an extra payment. Hall did not like him, and whenever he dared, he talked of the advisability of getting rid of him. But he showed his dislike chiefly by concealing it ostentatiously and avoiding his visitor as much as possible. "'Wait till the summer,' said Mrs. Hall sagely, "'when the artists are beginning to come. Then we'll see. He may be a bit overbearing, but Bill settled punctual is Bill settled punctual. Whatever you like to say. The stranger did not go to church, and indeed made no difference between Sunday and the ir irreligious days, even in costume. He worked, as Mrs. Hall thought, very fitfully. Some days he would come down early and be continuously busy. On others, he would rise late, pace his room, fretting audibly for hours altogether, smoke, sleep in the armchair by the fire. Communication with the world beyond the village, he had none. His temper continued very uncertain. For the most part, his manner was that of a man suffering under almost unendurable provocation, and once or twice things were snapped, torn, crushed, or broken in spasmodic gusts of violence. He seemed under a chronic irritation of the greatest intensity. His habit of talking to himself in a low voice grew steadily upon him, but though Mrs. Hall listened conscientiously, she could make neither head nor tail of what she heard. He rarely went abroad by daylight, but at twilight he would go out muffled up invisibly, <laughs> whether the weather were cold or not, and he chose the loneliest paths and those most overshadowed by trees and banks, his, his goggling spectacles, he put them together now, and ghastly bandaged face under the penthouse of his hat, came with a disagreeable suddenness out of the darkness upon one or two home-going laborers, and Teddy Henfrey, tumbling out of the scarlet coat one night at half-past nine, was scared shamefully by the stranger's skull-like head. He was walking hat in hand, lit by the sudden light as the door of the I can talk. Lit by the sudden light of the opened in door, such children as saw him at nightfall dreamt of boogies. Boogies, not boogers. And it seemed doubtful whether he disliked boys more than he disliked him, or the reverse. But there was certainly a vivid enough dislike on either side. It was inevitable that a person of so remarkable an appearance and bearing should form a frequent topic in such a village as Ipping. Opinion was greatly divided upon his occupation. Mrs. Hall was sensitive on the point. When questioned, she explained very carefully that he was an experimental investigator going gingerly over the syllables as woman who dreads pitfalls. When asked what an experimental investigator was, she would say with a touch of superiority that most educated people knew such things as that, and would thus explain that he discovered things. Her visitor had had an accident, she said, which temporarily discolored his face and hands, and being of a sensitive disposition, he was adverse to any public notice on the fact. Which, of course, he only makes more discussion by covering up with bandages. That last part was me, not the thing. Out of her hearing, there was a view largely entertained that he was a criminal trying to escape from justice by wrapping him up so as to conceal himself altogether from the eye of the police. Again, making yourself conspicuous is not a good way to hide from the police. This idea sprang from the brain of Mr. Teddy Henfrey. No crime of any magnitude dating from the middle or end of February was known to have occurred. Elaborated in the imagination of Mr. Gould, the probationary assistant in the National School, this theory took the form that the stranger was an anarchist in disguise, preparing explosives, and he resolved to undertake such detective operations as his time permitted. These consisted for the most part in looking very hard at the stranger whenever they met, or in asking people who had never seen the stranger leading questions about him. 
but he detected nothing. Another school of opinion followed Mr. Farron's side, and either accepted the piebald view or some modification of it, as, for instance, Silas Durgan, who was heard to assert that if he chooses to show himself at fairs, he'd make his fortune in no time. Little do they know, there wouldn't be much to show. And being a bit of a theologian, compared the stranger to the man with one talent. Yet another view explained the entire matter by regarding the stranger as a harmless lunatic. That had the advantage of accounting for everything straight away. I suppose. He's still an ass. Between these main groups, there were waverers and compromisers. Sussex folk have few superstitions, and it was only after the events of early April that the thought of the supernatural was first whispered in the village. Even then, it was only credited among the women folk. Hmm. But whatever they thought of him, people in Epping, on the whole, agreed in disliking him. I also agree. His irritability, though it might have been comprehensible to an urban brain worker, was an amazing thing to these quiet Sussex villagers. The frantic gesticulations they surprised now and then, the headlong pace after nightfall that swept him upon the round, quiet corners, the inhuman bludgeoning of all tentative advances of curiosity, the taste for twilight that led to the closing of doors, the pulling down of blinds, the extinction of candles and lamps. Who could agree such going on, goings ons? They drew aside as he passed down the village, and when he had gone by, young humorists would up with coat collars and down with hat brims go pacing nervously after him in imitation of his occult bearing. There was a song popular at the time called The Boogeyman. Bogeyman, technically. Miss Statchel sang it at the schoolroom concert in aid of the church lamps. And thereafter, whenever one or two of the villagers were gathered together and the stranger appeared, a bar or so of this tune, more or less sharp or flat, was whistled in the midst of them. Also, belated little children would call Boogeyman after him and make off tremulously elated. Cuss, the general practitioner, was devoured by curiosity. The bandages excited his professional interest. The report of the thousand and one bottles aroused his jealous regard. All through April and May, he coveted an opportunity of talking to the stranger. And at last, towards Whitsuntide, he could stand it no longer. What the heck is Whitsuntide? but hit upon the subscription list for a village nurse as an excuse. He was surprised to find that Mr. Hall did not know his guest's name. He gave a name, said Mrs. Hall, an assertion which was quite unfounded, but I didn't rightly hear it. <clears throat> she thought it seemed so silly not to know the man's name. Cuss rapped at the parlor door and entered. There was a fairly audible imprecation from within. Pardon my intrusion, said Mr. Cuss. Said Cuss, sorry. And then the door closed and cut Mrs. Hall off from the rest of the conversation. As though she didn't listen at the door. She always listens at the door. She could hear the murmur of voices for the next ten minutes, then a cry of surprise, a stirring of feet, a chair flung aside, a bark of laughter, quick steps to the door, and Cuss appeared, his face white, his eyes staring over his shoulder. He left the door open behind him, and without looking at her, strode across the hall and went down the steps, and she heard his feet hurrying along the road. He carried his hat in his hand. <clears throat> she stood behind the door, looking at the open door of the parlor. Then she heard the stranger laughing quietly, and then his footsteps came across the room. She could not see his face where she stood. The parlor door slammed, and the place was silent again. Cuss went straight up the village to bunting the vicar. Am I mad? Cuss began abruptly as he entered the shabby little study. Do I look like an insane person? What's happened? 
said the vicar, putting the ammonite on the loose sheets of his forthcoming sermon. That chap at the inn. Well, give me something to drink, said Cust as he sat down. When his nerves had been steadied by a glass of cheap sherry, the only drink the good vicar had available, he told him of the interview he had just had. Went in, he gasped, and began to demand a subscription for the nurse fund. He'd stuck his hands in his pockets as I came in, and he sat down lumply in his chair, sniffed. I told him I'd heard he took an interest in scientific things. He said yes, sniffed again, kept on sniffing all the time, evidently recently caught an infernal cold. No wonder wrapped up like that. I developed the nurse's idea and all the while kept my eyes open. Bottles, chemicals, everywhere. Balance, test tubes and stands and a smell of evening primrose? Would he subscribe? Said he'd consider it. Asked him point blank. Was he researching? Said he was. A long research? Got quite cross. A damnable long research, said he. "'Blowing the cork out, so to speak. "'Oh,' said I, and out came the grievance. "'The man was just on the boil, and my question boiled him over. "'He had been given a prescription, most valuable prescription. "'What for, he wouldn't say. Was it medical? "'Damn you, what are you fishing after?' "'I apologized, dignified sniff and cough. "'He resumed. He'd read it. Five ingredients. "'Put it down, turned his head.' draft of air from the window lifted the paper switch rustle he was working in a room with an open fireplace he said saw a flicker and there was the prescription burning and lifting chimney word rushed towards it just as it whisked up the chimney so just at that point to illustrate his story out came his arm well no hand just an empty sleeve lord i thought that's a deformity got a cork arm i suppose and has taken it off then I thought, there's something odd in that. What the devil keeps that sleeve up and open if there's nothing in it? There was nothing in it, I tell you. Nothing down it. Right down to the joint. I could see right down it to the elbow, and there was a glimmer of light shining through a tear in the cloth. Good God, I said, and then he stopped. Stared at me with those black goggles of his, and then at his sleeve. Well, that's all. He never said a word, just glared, put his sleeve back in his pocket, quickly. I was saying, said he, that there was the prescription burning, wasn't I? Interrogative cough. How the devil, said I, can you move an empty sleeve like that? Empty sleeve? Yes, said I, an empty sleeve. It's an empty sleeve, is it? You saw it was an empty sleeve? He stood up right away, I stood up too. He came towards me in three very slow steps and stood quite close, sniffed venomously. I didn't flinch, though I'm hanged if that bandaged knob of his and those blinkers aren't enough to unnerve anyone. Coming quietly up to you. You said it was an empty sleeve, he said. Certainly, I said, at staring and saying nothing, a bare-faced man, unsuspected, starts scratch. Then, very quietly, he pulled his sleeve out of his pocket again and raised an arm towards me as though he would show it to me again. He did it very, very slowly. I looked at it. Seemed an age. Well, said I, clearing my throat, there's nothing in it. Had to say something. I was beginning to feel frightened. I could see right down it. He extended it straight towards me, slowly, slowly, just like that, until the cuff was six inches from my face. Queer thing to see an empty sleeve come at you like that. And then, well, something exactly like a finger and thumb, it felt, nipped my nose. Bunting began to laugh. There wasn't anything there, said Cuss, his voice running up to a shriek at the there. It's all very well for you to laugh, but I tell you, I was so startled. I hit his cuff hard and turned around and cut out of the room. I left him... Cuss stopped. There was no mistaking the sincerity of his panic. 
He turned round in a helpless way and took a second glass of the excellent vicar's very inferior sherry. When I hit his cuff, I tell you, it felt exactly like hitting an arm. There wasn't an arm! There wasn't the ghost of an arm! Mr. Bunting thought it over. He looked suspiciously at Cuss. It's a most remarkable story, he said. He looked very wise and grave indeed. It's really, said Mr. Bunting with judicial emphasis, a most remarkable story. Oh, look, we have time for a fifth chapter, or for a third chapter. Apparently, he's not quite as long winded as our good Miss Shelley, Mrs. Shelley. Chapter 5 The Burglary at the Vicarage. The facts of the burglary at the vicarage came to us chiefly through the medium of the vicar and his wife. It occurred in the small hours of the Whit Monday, the day devoted to Ipping to the club festivities. Mrs. Bunting, it seems, woke up suddenly in the stillness that comes before the dawn, with a strong impression that the door of their bedroom had opened and closed. She did not arouse her husband at first, but sat up in bed listening. She then dist yeah, distinctly heard the pad, pad, pad of bare feet coming out of the adjoining dressing room and walking along the passage towards the staircase. As soon as she felt assured of this, she aroused the Reverend Mr. Bunting as quietly as possible. He did not strike a light, but putting on his spectacles, her dressing gown... <clears throat> Putting on his spectacles, her dressing gown, and his bath slippers. He went out on the landing to listen. He heard quite distinctly a fumbling going on at his study desk downstairs, and then a violent sneeze. At that, he returned to his bedroom, armed himself with the most obvious weapon, the poker, and descended the staircase as noiselessly as possible. Mrs. Bunting came out on the landing. The hour was about four, and the ultimate darkness of the night was past. There was a faint shimmer in the light in the hall, but the study doorway yawned impenetrably black. Everything was still except the faint creaking of the stairs under Mr. Bunting's tread, and the slight movements in the study. Then something snapped. The drawer opened, and there was a rustle of papers. Then came an imprecation, and a match was struck, and the study was flooded with yellow light. Mr. Bunting was now in the hall, and through the crack of the door he could see the desk and the open drawer and a candle burning on the desk. But the robber he could not see. He stood there in the hall, undecided what to do, and Mrs. Bunting, her face, face white and intent, crept slowly downstairs after him. One thing kept Mr. Bunting's courage. The persuasion that this burglar was a resident in the village. <clears throat> They heard the chink of money and realized that the robber had found the housekeeping reserve of gold. Two pounds ten and half sovereigns altogether. And that sound, Mr. at that sound, Mr. Bunting was nerved to abrupt action. Gripping the poker firmly, he rushed into the room, closely followed by Mrs. Bunting. Surrender, called Mr. Bunting fiercely and then stopped, amazed. Apparently the room was perfectly empty. Yet their conviction that they had, that very moment, heard somebody moving in the room, had amounted to a certainty. For half a minute, perhaps, they stood gaping when Mrs. Bunting went across the room and looked behind the screen, while Mr. Bunting, by a kindred impulse, peered under the desk. Then Mrs. Bunting turned back the window curtains and Mr. Bunting looked up the chimney and probed it with the poker. I find this very funny. Then Mrs. Bunting scrutinized the waste paper basket and Mr. Bunting opened the lid of coal scuttle. As though those are places the robber would be. Then they came to a stop and stood with eyes interrogating each other. I could have sworn, said Mr. Bunting. The candle! Who lit the candle? The drawer, said Mr. Bunting, and the money's gone. She went hastily to the doorway. Of all the strange occurrences! There was a violent sneeze in the passage. 
They rushed out, and as they did so, the kitchen door slammed. "'Bring the candle,' said Mr. Bunting, and led the way. They both heard a sound of bolts being hastily shot back. As he opened the kitchen door, he saw through the scullery that the back door was just opening, and the faint light of early dawn displayed the dark masses of the garden yard beyond. He is certain that nothing went out of the door. It opened, stood open for a moment, and then closed with a slam. As it did so, the candle Mrs. Bunting was carrying from the study flickered and flared. It was a minute or more before they entered the kitchen. The place was empty. The reef they refastened the back door, examined the kitchen, pantry, and scullery thoroughly, and at last went down into the cellar. There was not a soul to be found in the house. Search as they would. Daylight found the vicar and his wife, a quaintly costumed little couple, still marveling about on their own ground by the unnecessary light of a guttering candle. <clears throat> Completely unrelated to anything important in that chapter. If he was wearing her dressing gown, was she wearing his or did she come down improperly dressed? Because very specifically it said his slippers, the poker, and her dressing gown. Yeah, the next chapter is a little too long to read and keep it under the hour. So we'll stop there for the day. I hope you enjoyed it and that my tangents on certain inconsistencies didn't get too rambly. If you liked it, please hit that subscribe button, like, and review. You can leave voice messages at anchor.fm slash tangents on cracked spines. There is a Facebook page called Tangents on Cracked Spines Book Club where you can converse with me and other people who like this uh, podcast, leave suggestions, vote on the next story to be read. You can also visit me personally on Instagram or TikTok at FrankieCore92. And thank you and see you next time. And a reminder, I now have merch. Now, leave suggestions about what you think uh, Invisible Man merch should be.